Hi, I'm Scott Simi. I am the editor-in-chief of DroneDJ.com, and we have a very special guest today. All right, today I am super happy that we are being joined by Romeo Dersher, who is the Vice President of Public Safety at Aterion. Romeo, welcome. Scott, thank you. Thanks so much for, for inviting me over. Um, we always have great conversations, so I'm excited to speak to you and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get some really good input into, you know, the, the drone world here. Excellent. Now, I think the last time we spoke, you had just made the transition to Aterion. Could, could you tell us just a little bit about what your job entails? What, what do you actually do there? So um, I'm still very focused on public safety because uh, that is not only where I'm very, very passionate about, but um, there are so many great applications that we have developed um, over the years and we still have only you know, scratch the surface of the possibilities. Um, but also now I'm in, in a more leadership position than I was before. And that also allows me to lead a variety of different individuals and teams at Autarian and help them uh, to the next level. It's, it's really fascinating because now we're seeing more and more young people join the drone industry. They come straight out of you know, university. It's, it's potentially their first job. And they're very fascinated by this whole concept of the drone industry. And with that fascination also comes uh, a new thinking, a different thinking than us you know, old timers, but also sometimes um, what I like to say a little bit of a naive thinking because they haven't, they have these great ideas of things that they would like to do, but reality is always a little bit different, especially when you start looking at verticals like public safety, where it's very standardized, where it's very, you know, almost stubbornly in one direction. And we're trying to break that thinking. So it's a lot of fun. I, I truly enjoy this, this new environment, this, this new role, but it's also uh, challenging because we are doing something very different. And I think that's where really the, the big fun comes to life. Uh, now, speaking of fun, you know, I, I follow you on LinkedIn and on Twitter, and just recently you were posting some amazing photos from a trip you were on to Switzerland. You're you're up in the mountains at a high altitude doing doing drone testing. What what was that trip about? What can you tell us about what you, what you were doing? Yeah, so I know you know Scott. Uh, for many many years, I have been talking about integrating VTOL, the vertical takeoff and landing uh, platforms, into public safety. And uh, I I was working on a on a concept before, but unfortunately it got shelved, which uh, really didn't make me too happy, but such is life. But now I'm at a place where VTOL solutions are ready to be integrated. And that kind of changes the landscape. So uh, we, we've, we've gotten used to these multi-rotors. We've gotten used to, you know, flying with the multi-rotors, letting go of the sticks and it just hovers in place. And, you know, we've gotten used to the 25 minute roughly flight times. And suddenly now we have this capability of being in the air for, you know, up to two hours or even more, depending on the platform, um, of doing different types of missions, different types of data sets. And that is a change. And so I have always wanted to validate these type of technologies, these type of tactics before we really start pushing them into real life scenarios. And so one of the trips, um, one of the tests we did a few weeks ago in Switzerland was really to go up into a fairly high altitude with VTOL platforms and do two things. Number one, uh, observe the performance because uh, a lot of uh, applications happen in high altitudes and that can be you know, mountain search and rescue, that can be inspection, uh, that can be um, avalanche detection, you name it. There are tons of applications where you know, we're, we're talking about high altitude. And so those platforms 
they have to perform and they do perform. And we want to secondly also then fine tune the software side so that these platforms uh, fly as effectively and efficiently as possible in, in those higher environments. And so we went up into the Swiss mountains on top of a glacier and, you know, it's the middle of June. It's still, you know, a lot of snow up there. In fact, at night it was snowing. So the conditions were just perfect to do these kind of tests. And um, for the team, it's really good that they get to see what the expectation is and work with people like myself and others that have been around this for quite some time to, to get a much better understanding. And so we had a really great time up there. Obviously uh, it was challenging, but you know, that's, that's reality. When, when, when you have a situation you need to deploy drones, especially in the mountains, there most likely is a challenge either by terrain, by weather, uh, the environments. And so doing real life testing and validations, that's just a key component. And, and was it overall a fairly successful trip? Did you sort of get some really good learnings out of that? Yes, absolutely. It was an extremely successful trip. So uh, the concept of Artarian is that in essence, the drone is a, a connected device. So we have connectivity on our platforms. And while flying, in this case, we were flying the quantum systems vector, uh, which is a, a, a VTOL platform, uh, about nine feet wingspan. Um, we were getting health data right away. So we were observing the behavior of the aircraft in this environment in real time and adjusting uh, parameters right there and then on the spot to really fine tune uh, the software side of it. And so uh, having the ability to do that in real time makes the process not only much more simple, uh, but it also shows what the future holds because we wanna enable operators to see not only the health of their fleet in real time, but to also then get the data into their workflows in real time. And, and when you're talking about making adjustments on the scene while you're there, are you talking about engineers opening up a laptop and actually changing lines of code and re-uploading the firmware and, and off you go again? That's exactly it. So uh, looking at the health data, looking at the parameters of, of all these systems, and then really analyzing what is happening, going into the code, making a couple of line adjustments, sending it back, and then flying it again and seeing the difference. Uh, that, that is extremely fascinating. And this is a new way of testing and validating um, you know, software and hardware components. Uh, before, it was a much, much more difficult process of offloading flight data, analyzing the flight data after the flight, doing this in real time um, is also a new concept for me that I have to get adjusted to because it opens up so many more opportunities. It, just as a brief aside, there was a startup company that I was working with and we were out in the field doing some testing some days and they were trying to have a VTOL drone come down and land perfectly on an infrared beacon. And there were problems, the drone was wobbly, et cetera. And I would watch these engineers open up the laptops, change the code, things would improve another couple of times. And all of a sudden, there it is working beautifully. And I have to say, I was blown away to, to watch a person just do this in real time. And I'm seeing the results on you know the drone in the air. So it's really quite something, as you say, to watch watch that process and to be able to do that kind of real-time validation. Now, you were also, because you've been a busy guy and on a bunch of planes, you were also just down in Florida, I understand, with some first responders or emergency responders. What can you tell us about what you were doing down there? In essence, you know, it goes back to this whole concept of integrating VTOL into public safety. And, and validating the use cases. How would it work? What would it look like? Are there actually benefits of having a VTOL doing a high level situational awareness, providing a common operating picture? And what additional features could help like ATAC, the Android uh, Team Awareness Kit, 
which is a, a geospatial tool that helps you you know, identify your, your ground units, where they are, and, and, and integrating all of that to give you a much better situational overview of an incident. And, you know, it all sounds so great when we, when we talk about it, when we write about it, you know, there's a lot of, you know, great marketing people that put really good words together, but does it really help in real life? Those are the things that I want to find out and that I want to work with the people that actually will be using the technology if it passes um, and, and provide feedback. And so this is a part of series. This is the first part of a series of validation projects where I want to start changing the mindset that yes, we do have multi-rotors and multi-rotors will continue to be used. They have a specific function. They are great to fly, you know, low ground missions. They can go into areas where, you know, other vehicles or individuals may not safely go. But what about a higher level approach? What about a second layer? What about a VTOL that circles uh, uh, an incident site at 120 meters, 400 feet in, and flies very big circles uh, and, and provides the situational overview of the incident. How would that get integrated? And with everything, it's about the data. That's the key piece. You know, that's the new oil and gold in the drone industry. Yeah, hardware is cool and hardware will continue to improve. But we are changing now the focus to the data piece. So that was, in essence, the, the, the whole concept of, of this Florida trip, the first time that we are validating VTOL in, in public safety. And I'm excited because it is a, a different thinking. It is a different approach yet again. Now, a lot of people who are in the enterprise field would know about Autarian, uh, but a lot of our viewers are also consumers who just enjoy recreational and, and hobby flights. What can you tell them about the company, what you do, or what Autarian does? And also maybe if you could, it, it's, a, it's a tough question, but if you could sort of simplify this whole concept of open source, which is so very much with what you're involved with right now. Yes, uh, it is, it is a, such a great question. How to explain Autarian? Because it is something very, very different. Um, before, we've, we've really focused a lot on the hardware components. And, you know, like I said, hardware will continue to improve. But what we realized over the last few years is really that there is no one company that can do it all. Um, even though we have one player that has a very high market share, but we are reaching the limitations of that technology because of the way it has been structured. And at Altarian, what we're trying to do is, number one, we're we're a software company that has one piece of hardware. And that hardware is the brain of the drone. It's the flight controller. But it's actually a little bit more. It's not really a flight controller. It is a connectivity device that has an, a mission computer on it that just happens to also be a flight controller, very similar to our smartphones. They are not phones anymore. Yes, they just happen to be phones, but they're everything else. They're the camera, they're the connection device, they're your, your source of information. I mean, you name it, it is your smartphone, but it just happens so that you can also make calls. And this is Autarian. So the founder of Autarian, Dr. Lawrence Meyer, is the brain of PixHawk. In 2008, he developed PixHawk flight controller. And over the years, uh, really realized that with the power of open source, with, you know, if in the beginning students that were working on code together, everybody had a little bit of, of, a, of an input into the, the greater system, you can achieve much more in less time. You have a bigger community that can contribute um, to a certain solution. And that's not a new concept. We've seen that in the computer industry uh, as well. Um, Red Hat is a very perfect example of, of taking open source components and then turning them into an enterprise solution. 
And so that's what we do at, at Autarian. Now, why is that interesting? Well, if you're a drone manufacturer, putting effort into the development of your flight controller and the flight software stack is a real challenge because that's really what keeps the drone operational. Yes, the hardware is, a, is, is as important as well, but you know that software, that, that flight controller component is really challenging. And so instead of doing everything yourself, uh, these developers, these, these uh, OEMs, the drone manufacturers, they come to Ontario and they say, hey, can we either have your SkyNote, which is the, the physical flight controller piece, or the reference design so we can build the drone around what's already existing. And that allows them to go to market much quicker with a team behind them that understands that whole flight software stack uh, in, in, in depth. So that's, that's Autarian. And by doing that, we're doing a few things. First of all, we're creating a true ecosystem. It's not just one drone manufacturer. Now it's multiple drone manufacturers that run on this system, which means we can now standardize it. Think of it this way. You have one controller and you're flying a VTOL. You're landing the VTOL and you're switching over to a multi-rotor with the same controller, the same user interface, and now you're operating that multi-rotor. And maybe you're done and now you're switching over to a ground unit, a rover with the same controller, the same user interface. Suddenly you're realizing, wait a second, this is, this is game changing because I have to learn one system, but I can fly all these different platforms. And furthermore, now the, the, the payload manufacturers, they can create their solutions to one standard and it can go onto this aircraft, it can go onto that aircraft, it can go onto the rover. You're really truly now building an ecosystem of hardware. And because all of this is powered by our Autarian SkyNote, that also means the connectivity exists. So the data goes into your Autarian suite, the software component that controls it all. You can see the health data, you can see the, the data that's being gathered. And now you wanna get it into your own workflow. Maybe you're doing an ESRI uh, uh, workflow where you wanna have a orthomosaic output or a PIX4D, a drone deploy, unblur for situation awareness. So we can set this up so that the data in the background while you're conducting your mission goes into your workflow. And I call it the near death of the SD card, which is you know, very dramatic and it's not reality, but it really highlights that up until today, the data transfer process has been extremely manual. And at some point that does not allow for scalability. If you have to constantly take SD cards out of a drone, offload the data, put it on a, on a system, then upload it to, into your workflow, you are decreasing your efficiency. And here is really where, where all of this ties together. We have a standardized approach, connectivity, integration into the workflows, and suddenly, your, your drone deployment, your drone missions become a very effective and efficient way of, of doing a job. And that's in essence, Altarian. That's a, that's a very good explanation, uh, Romeo, thank you. You know, what, one of the things that always confused me a little bit is when we talk about open source and you're talking about people being able to contribute to, you know, the greater good of, of what that code can do, is that in my mind, somewhere in the back of my mind, it used to make me think, oh, well then that can't be very secure if anyone can just sort of hop in and start changing lines of code. But in fact, it's actually a very secure platform. Uh, am I correct in, in that assumption? Yes, that, that, that's, and you know, that's very, the, the word open source really kind of immediately makes you think, wait a second, can anyone just go in and add something? Uh, reality is a little bit different. Um, we, we are, we're taking what's available. Autarian is taking what's available from the community of, you know, 
10,000 plus developers. And our engineers then go through and test uh, the codes and everything and adjust also certain items to make them more user-friendly. Because reality is these 10,000 plus developers, they're brilliant, but they may not have end user experience. They may not have search and rescue experience or power line inspection experience. And so maybe their solution is not as fine-tuned or as user-friendly as it should or could be. And so that's where Arterian comes in and then also not only validates the code, but adjusts certain items, brings in our expertise to make it a software piece that brings the benefits to the end users. And so it is, it is really, it is secure, it is safe. It's also community vetted. And, you know, it brings up some, some other additional um, questions and, and benefits. And for example, if we start thinking about, you know, AI and machine learning and, you know, all the questions that come up with, with that, like, who do we want to determine the behavior of this technology? Should this be an individual? Should this be government? Should this be the community? You know, those are some really interesting questions. And my take is if we can get the community to create the rules around it, we have a much more leveled approach than if we say, you know, one individual determines how AI is being utilized or government is, is determining how AI is being utilized. So uh, open source really brings together um, the community, a community-based approach, full transparency. It's, it's like a democracy approach in essence. So it's a trusted foundation uh, for autonomy. It's providing society with the really necessary checks and balances to validate the behavior of software and then to integrate that all. Um, so I, I would say Autarian is the Android of the drone industry. We have a common you know, OS operating system that works on various different platforms. Just like if you have an Android phone or tablet, it's not one manufacturer. You can choose from different manufacturers, but no matter which manufacturers, the behavior is the same. The layout, the user experience is the same. And that's our goal. And that's what we are achieving with Atarian. Now, prior to you going to Atarian, you had a very high profile, very successful, almost illustrious career with, with DJI. And in particular, with a focus on you know, enterprise and public safety. Um, Recently, I mean, there's no doubt that DJI is still the global leader when it comes to drone sales, but recently we've seen, and certainly I've heard from some enterprise operators and some first responders that they're starting to cast their eyes out and look at other options as well. Now, now part of that may be just simply because there are more drones available on the market right now, but what's your take on, on why people are now starting to look at other potential solutions in addition to, to DJI? There, there is no question um, about the fact that we are here today thanks to all the work we did at DJI. And DJI has a lot of advantages. Uh, mass production is really one of them. Uh, getting units into the market is a challenge for you know, startup companies. So... Yes, there are, DJI will continue to, to have a very, very large market share, uh, especially on the consumer side. And, you know, to some degree also on the, on the enterprise, the commercial side. But what's really happening in the market is that for enterprise to be successful, a few things have to change. And that is scalability. Um, that is the way you interact with your platform, uh, standardization. And if that is not happening, then it becomes more and more difficult for a company to say, okay, we have 50 drones, we have 100 drones, we're going to scale up to 200 drones. If there's so much manual work behind it, just think about update, updating 100 drones when there is a new firmware. The way it's done um, on the DJI side is a nightmare. 
And this is not to trash DJI. This is a problem that we identified you know, a few years ago, but it was very challenging to, to find solutions for it. And at Atarian, we look at this from a different perspective where we're saying, you know, uh, we got to standardize in order to allow scalability. We got to ensure connectivity in order to make the most effective use of data with the least amount of time in between capture and review of the data. So it, ma it makes sense that um, the enterprise market is, is looking at other options because many entities have realized we are reaching you know, the limitation of what's currently available through, through DJI. And that allows other opportunities and other manufacturers and other visions to come in and take over, which ultimately is great for the entire drone industry. Now, the use of, of AI in drones and just the overall automation of workflows seems to be coming more prominent. A lot of people are talking about it. A lot of people are developing solutions for this. Do you see this as a, a pretty integral part of the future? And, and if so, why? Yes, absolutely. I think um, some of the changes that, that we are trying to do to not only enhance public safety, but other verticals as well, I, I, I categorize them in three areas a simply, simplified and intuitive user interface so that you make it easy and, and you know, logical to, to create missions, to execute missions, that it's standardized across, again, no matter which platform you are utilizing. The second piece is that real-time data delivery component if it's 4G, 5G, if it's mesh network, um, it doesn't matter. But the fact of the matter is that as a drone operator or as a, as a drone manager, UAV team manager, having the ability to see in real time where my drones are being flown, what is the help of each of the systems, and then also to get data streamed in real time is a huge benefit. And then the third component is that AI and apps on board, that, that mission computer that's on board of the aircraft so that you can run AI algorithms and they are becoming the norm in the drone industry now. Um, that is really where we need to go because reality is uh, if we just solely base um, the data consumption on the drone operator, um, we're overloading that person. It's like you're standing in, in under a waterfall and, and this water is just coming down on you. Um, it's just hammering you. And the same through with data. Right now, there's so much data that comes to an incident commander or uh, somebody that's doing an inspection. Anything that can help to filter out data like an AI algorithm that can improve and accelerate a process with potentially automatic um, object de de detection, um, that's an improvement already. So I'm super excited to see what, what else is in store. And it's not just AI, it's also the the, at the back end, uh, the, the various solutions, you know, your, your Esri, your PIX4D, your drone deploy, your Unblur, um, even, you know, a Dropbox can be uh, integrated as a piece of the workflow. And, and suddenly it changes the way we, we interact and utilize the data. Now, you've not only been kind of a, a pioneer in this industry, but I think anyone who understands the industry would realize that you have also helped to shape the industry in terms of products and, and use case scenarios. And you've been involved in so many different projects over the years, including the devastating wildfires in Paradise, California. Is there one project when you look back over your, your career that really stands out as I was so happy to be involved in this and, and so 
thrilled with what drones were able to do. Is there is there a high point that immediately comes to mind? You know, the, the Good Morning, ABC Good Morning America project in the largest cave in central Vietnam um, definitely is from, a, from an artistic perspective, from a life-changing moment type of view, certainly on top of, of my mind, flying drones in a cave and live streaming that uh, to the United States so that millions of people can watch it in real time. Um, that's fascinating. And, and you know, that's, that was six years ago. Um, but then also deploying to natural disasters, seeing the devastation, seeing um, how this technology is helping communities, um, first responders, the the emotions that come from that is still something that um, you know has 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 made it was probably the biggest impact. Um, I've been part of of search and rescue missions where you know you you have the the families and friends of the missing person close by and they are putting the faith in your in the first responders on the ground in the K9 units in the technology in the drones hoping that you know, we can bring back their loved ones. Um, those are very, very emotional and impactful projects to be part of. And every single time we learn something new. And if we can take that back, work with the teams behind the scenes uh, to improve something, um, we're, we're adding so much value. And that at the end of the day is really what makes me happy that I can see the progress, the improvements. And I am the lucky one in all of this. I can be in, on the front line. I can be out there. And sometimes it's also unluck because sometimes you have an issue and sometimes the technology doesn't operate and doesn't work and it's frustrating and you're in front of the families trying to make it work or in front of other customers or end users and something's just not right. But really behind the scenes is where a lot of the great magic happens. And those individuals, those women and men, they are not always in the spotlight and highlighted enough, but the connection between end user, me and that team, that is the key. That is what makes it so, so powerful. If we can really grab the knowledge, translate it so that engineers understand what, what's needed, they make it happen. Everyone in this wins. You've been involved, I think, since about the days when, when DJI was still producing the flame wheel. Um, did, you've always had an, an inside track and an inside view in this industry, but I'm curious if it still surprised you how quickly things have developed and the technological advances that have happened over the past five, eight years. Yes and no. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised at, at a few things, how quickly we've gotten to certain milestones. Um, on the other hand, I'm, I'm also surprised that we're not further. And that's probably because I'm fairly impatient uh, in general. I would like to, you know, reach for the stars. And, and right now we're, we're, you know, somewhere above the, the Swiss Alps, maybe. Uh, so there's, there's still a lot of room to, to grow. Um, but yes, we have come long ways. The industry has come long ways. Um, it's, it's actually fairly interesting because in, in 2016, 2016, at a keynote, I made the point that as an industry, we have to change our approach. We cannot just make claims of drones, you know, do this and that, save lives, save money, save times without validation, without proper data behind it. Because first of all, it hurts the industry when it doesn't do what, what it's being said. Secondly, um, it's cheap marketing. Words are extremely easy to use. It has to be validated. And for a couple of years after that, I saw a real big improvement in the industry. And then recently we've kind of gone back to what I call a lot of smoke and mirrors in the industry. And that's the surprising part that this is still happening and that people still, you know, listen to, to some of these claims that are being made, to some of these products that are being advertised, um, promising almost the world when 
reality may very well be different. And that is a challenge that can hurt the drone industry because we need to mature. We need to be a much more validated uh, industry so that end users really know if this person says something, if this company says something, it is true, it is validated. And there I am surprised that we go through this phase again. Romeo, I, I literally could, could speak with you all day because you're such an outstanding communicator and you've just got such a, a breadth of knowledge uh, that very, very few people have in terms of the overall industry and its historical development. But I know you're a busy guy. So we'll, we'll wrap it up here at this end. I, I really look forward to hearing what Atarian is up to next. And Romeo Dersher, you are the Vice President of Public Safety at Atarian. I thank you so much for joining us today. This has been fascinating as usual, and we really, truly appreciate your time. Thank you, Scott. And thanks for all the work that you do, sharing information, sharing you know, the positive use cases, uh, inside information to not only the people in the drone industry, but to everyone that, that can and wants to read it is an extremely important piece of all of this. And I always enjoy coming back to you and speaking with you. So thank you. Th thanks so much, uh, Romeo, and look forward to speaking with you down the road. Beep.